what is depression? And what are the types of depression? What kind of depression have you seen and experienced and researched? And how can people overcome it? How can humans overcome it and deal with it, live with it and overcome it? So this is my clinical uh, specialty. I see patients in the, my outpatient clinical work with treatment-resistant depression, so very uh, hard to treat, severe illness where medications haven't been, been working. I also see patients with uh, autism spectrum disorders. These are my two uh, clinical uh, focal areas. But then I do emergency room work uh, 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 as well. But the depression, why do I focus on that? It's so, uh, you, one feels tantalizingly close to helping these uh, people who are suffering so deeply. That's And that's why I focused on it, is these are people who, there, there may not even be anything situational that's that's difficult or challenging in their life. You can have people who seem to have, have everything that you would want. Every objective measure of their life is fine, and yet they can be uh, just, uh, hit with this unstoppable hopelessness, an inability to see into the future, a discounting of the value of their own action. Anything they can imagine themselves doing seems worthless, or they are unable to enjoy things. We call this anhedonia. There's no reward, no pleasure, not in food, social interaction, movies, books, anything that they would enjoy positivity gone. They can have a profound negative internal state, psychic pain. And these things can seem, and in the severe cases, are inescapable. So what is going on? Why, why is this state part of the human existence? It's got a strong biological, genetic link. We know that. Um, it's been linked to certain genes, uh, certain regions of the chromosome, and twin studies, there's a clear genetic link. It doesn't explain everything, but it's a big part of it. Genetics are a strong contributor. And although you can have depression without anything terrible going on in your life, the symptoms can be made worse by stressors, uh, by trauma. And, but at a very deep level, uh, there's nothing we can measure in a person objectively, so we don't have, there's not a, a known chemical, not a known structure that's different, not a known brain activity pattern that we can pick up with EEG. A lot of people are exploring this, but right now we have no objective measures. All we do is talk to people and we elicit these symptoms. Uh, we explore them, distinguish them from other possible causes, and then what do we do? Well, we have uh, a range of treatments. We have medications that uh, can help people, do help people, but not everybody. Um, and if they don't work, then we can go to brain stimulation methods. We can do things even like electroconvulsive therapy, which is uh, a very effective, but it's, it's, a, it's sort of the, the final thing we go to in the end. And so we have treatments. They, they work uh, uh, for some people. They don't do everything we'd like. But here's the problem is at a very deep level, we don't understand really what's going on in the brain. We don't have a physical interpretation of the problem. We have all these symptoms, but we can't yet point to a set of cells or a set of circuits or an activity pattern that is causing major depression, this disease state per se in human beings. Why do you think you can't yet from an optogenetics perspective? Is it because there's so many possible causes? Is it so much, so many things involved? So I think the answer is there are many things involved and all these different symptoms that I've mentioned, those we can study and those we can fix, the individual symptoms. And we can do this in animals, to be clear. So in a mouse, for example, we can instantaneously and precisely turn up or down the motivation of, a, of an animal to overcome a challenge. We can turn up or down its ability to, to, to be motivated by or we think experience reward from, from uh, situations or, or actions. We can increase its apparent energy level, its, its, uh, its, its, uh, its drive uh, to meet challenges. Uh, we can turn up or down social interaction. Uh, all these individual features of depression, individual symptoms, we now can point to, to exact projections and cells 
that are causal in mediating these. But what we don't know is why all these different symptoms show up together in major depression in the human disease syndrome. And that's that's the mystery. It's, it's sort of, in other fields of medicine, you know, someone with congestive heart failure who comes into the clinic, they have very different symptoms. They have shortness of breath and they have swollen feet, okay? Couldn't be two more different uh, across the body uh, sets of symptoms. Neither one obviously related to the heart, but they're both happening because the heart is not working as a pump, okay? And, and now, thankfully in cardiology, we understand these disparate symptoms that seem totally unrelated can be completely understood because there's an altered pump action of the heart. That's that's what we are hoping for in in psychiatry and in, in the study of depression or any disease. These different symptoms, the inability to enjoy things, the hopelessness. Uh, what's the what's the unifying You're principle? Unifying. Yeah. I mean, is there is there some truth to that the Tolstoy quote that all happy families are alike and each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way? So basically, yeah. I mean, this is the human condition. And and it basically there might, you know, the physicists long to find the theory of everything. It, it isn't understanding depression essentially require you to really have the big theory of everything for the human mind? I think we, it would certainly be nice to have that a theory of everything. <laughs> don't get me wrong. I don't think we the need a statement <laughs> of the of the century. It would be nice. It, well, it's, it's also a good question if it's possible. Yeah, yeah. Well, that that I I have uh, some thoughts on too. But but to your to this specific question, um, I don't think we need a theory of everything. I think there will be unifying principles principles we can get to. But even shy of that, if we can we can treat symptoms, and that's a big step. And as you say, different different unhappy families are different. Different unhappy people are different. If we have somebody who comes to the clinic and I see someone with a profound anhedonia as one of their main symptoms, inability to enjoy things. And if I know, based on optogenetics work and animal work, that a particular medication can treat anhedonia, even if it doesn't fix major depression in everybody, if I treat that one symptom in that one person, that's a good thing. And and, and so I we don't need the theory of everything, and we don't even need the unifying principle to help people with insights that come from optogenetics. So how much does talking help? for diagnosis and for treatment, would you say, for depression? It's a big part of what we do. Every good psychiatrist is should be a pretty adept in these verbal communications and talk therapy as part of what they do. Um, I give medications, I deliver brain stimulation treatments, but a big, big part of everything I do with every patient is talk therapy because it works so well together with these other modalities. Even alone, it can help people with moderate or or mild depression by itself. People with severe depression, people with other psychiatric illnesses that are, are severe, you don't want to do talk therapy alone. It's not going to do it. But it still is crucial to do together with the others. And it's 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 critical because it's uh, part of how you reshape cognitions, you know, complex activity patterns, and, and you won't get to that with a medication or brain stimulation treatment.